Hello, uh, my name is Alan Lumsden and welcome to uh, Debakey CV. Uh, we're in the middle of the ISEVS uh, hands-on end of Ascular Symposium and because of that we have a lot of famous people here and the gentleman to my right happens to be one of those. So let me introduce you to Dr. Chris Ayrns. Chris, welcome to Houston. Welcome to Texas because I know that you moved your company here. Well, thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here and, and the symposium you have is absolutely outstanding. Well, thank you. What, what I want to do, there's a lot of people really would like to emulate your success, and you've been successful as a vascular surgeon, you're the president of the Society of Vascular Surgery, you're president of the ISEVS, um, and you're an entrepreneur. And so tell me how it began. I first knew you when I was at Emory, and you were working with some of the uh, mechanical engineers from Georgia Tech. Well, it, it all actually started then. When I started uh, my career at the University of Chicago as a young surgeon, vascular surgery actually had, didn't even exist uh, as a specialty. Uh, but I was starting to take care of patients with vascular disease doing surgical procedures, but I didn't really know anything about the disease, atherosclerosis. So at that time, uh, the University of Chicago was one of the specialized centers of research in atherosclerosis. I was studying the relationship between your diet and your cholesterol and va uh, vascular disease. Um, and everyone thought, as many people today think, that it's all about your diet and your heart, what you eat and what you do. But I, as a vascular surgeon, said, well, wait a minute. If it's your cholesterol, then the plaques should be all over your body. But they're not. Uh, they're very localized. They're in the carotid bifurcation, which is we treat with carotid endarterectomy. They're in your legs, but they're not in your upper vessels. And so why is that? So we got interested in the issue of localization of atherosclerotic lesions. I work with Seymour Glagoff, who is a vascular pathologist, a very, very famous uh, vascular pathology. He ran the autopsy suite at the University of Chicago. And back in those days, now we're talking 1976, it was a long time ago. If you wanted to know why someone died, you had to do an autopsy. These days, you can see everything with a CT scan and you do pre-mortem imaging and you know everything about what a patient has or doesn't have. But back then, you uh, couldn't find out unless you did an autopsy and then it was usually too late. Mm -hmm. But um, Dr. Glagoff, running the autopsy suite, had a brilliant idea. He, he thought that all of the textbooks about atherosclerosis were wrong because everyone said that the plaques bulge into the lumen. And oh my gosh, you've got this plaque and it's bulging into the lumen and it's obstructing the, the lumen and that's why you had a heart attack or that's why you had a stroke. Uh, and if you went to the surgeons, they said the same thing. They had an angiogram and then they wound up saying, gee, the disease was much worse than we thought from the angiogram. And when you think about it, that's because if you look at an artery at autopsy, the artery's collapsed. There's no blood pressure, no circulation. Same thing in the operating room. In order to operate on a blood vessel, you have to put clamps on the blood vessel. Again, no pressure. So the artery looks collapsed. So what Dr. Glagoff did, he see pressure perfusion fixed the arteries. Oh, is that right? And cadavers? Yes. Wow. And by pressure perfusion fixing the arteries, he dilated the lumen and fixed the arteries. And we now, for the first time, actually had an idea of what plaques actually looked like in real life. This was way before imaging. Yeah. Yeah. And so we started looking at the carotid bifurcation and looking at localization of plaques and trying to answer the question, why do plaques localize where they do? And it turns out that a lot has to do with the blood flow and hemodynamics. So if you think about it, uh, it's, it's sort of like uh, blood flow in a river. Uh, when the blood flow is, when the river flows slowly mm. or in eddy currents or in backwaters, the debris and the garbage collects. When it rains and the water flushes through, it wipes the <laughs> river banks clean. 
It's a great analogy. Uh, so the same thing in the human body. In the carotid sinus, the, there's an eddy flow pattern, and there's a slow flow in the carotid sinus, and that is where plaque material would tend to localize. That's also why when you exercise, you flush the arteries clean because you increase the circulation, increase the blood flow. So that was the beginning of how you got interested in hemodynamics. And then that led to a whole series of experiments, animal experiments. We built a glass model of the carotid bifurcation, looking at the flow patterns, and then we correlated the, lo the plaque localization to where there was slow flow in the carotid bifurcation. And so, long story short, uh, I spent 17 years at the University of Chicago, uh, and we, we did a lot of work on the whole idea of hemodynamics and atherosclerosis, including computational efforts mm -hmm. working with Georgia Institute of Technology, Don Giddens. Mm -hmm. When I then, in 1993, moved to Stanford uh, to start up a vascular program, uh, I uh, gave a lecture in the engineering school about uh, hemodynamics and atherosclerosis, uh, showing the experimental work that we had done and the, and the, and the uh, evidence that we had accumulated. And after the lecture, uh, a student came up to me and said, gee, that was very interesting. Uh, I'm working on a PhD and I'd like to have a project. Do you have a project for me? So uh, I said, sure, why don't you solve the three-dimensional pulsatile flow field of the human abdominal aorta? Because uh, we'd actually been trying to do that mm -hmm. <laughs> and hadn't gotten very far. But we, CT scans were available. We were now uh, able to see human arteries on CT scans. They, were, they uh, couldn't do the coronaries back then, but you could do the aorta and you could do the carotids very well. <clears throat> so uh, this young, bright Stanford PhD student took that on as his PhD project. I was his PhD advisor together with uh, Tom Hughes, who is a uh, um, biomechanics engineer now at the University of Texas in Austin. Uh, and the two of us were his uh, PhD advisors. He, in a year, he solved this computational problem it was a huge computation. Back then, uh, Cray computers were the largest uh, computer you could get, and uh, Silicon Graphics had hooked uh, 50 parallel Cray computers together to make a huge supercomputer to make Hollywood movies, you know, Jurassic Park, Dalmatia, uh, 1001 Dalmatians. You know, you need big computer power to create those uh, Hollywood images. So uh, the student, got access to this computer to run his computation uh, for his solution for this blood flow problem in the human abdominal aorta. The computer was where? So, in Hollywood? No, so Silicon, Silicon Graphics. Yeah. Silicon Graphics, okay. Silicon Graphics in, in yeah. Palo Alto. Yeah. So his computation time took one month. Wow. One month of running the computation to solve this. It's, that's how big the uh, mathematical problem is to solve this. And anyway, he was successful in, in solving this computational blood flow problem, uh, which was the very first time it had ever been done in a human artery. Uh, and so he wanted to uh, get a faculty job, as PhD students usually do, but he couldn't get a job at Stanford because Stanford doesn't hire its own PhD students. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> they have to go somewhere else. <laughs> Faculty get recruited from elsewhere to bring in new ideas. Otherwise, okay. Okay. otherwise PhD students would just continue to work on their professor's projects. And All right. Interesting concept. Okay. In any case, so I hired him instead of uh, him getting a job. Into the division of vascular surgery. I hired him in the, in the vascular surgery division. He was an assistant professor in the research track in vascular surgery. But now he was in the medical school, uh, and his name was Charlie Taylor. And Charlie Taylor and I shared, he worked in my lab, and, and uh, we shared uh, uh, NIH grants and NSF grants for the next 15 years. 
working on various aspects of computational. So all the, the experimental work was now being done computationally. Yeah. Uh, and then what happened uh, was uh, all of the imaging technology advanced and by 2005, the, the very first uh, blood flow analysis was done in 1994. So now almost a decade later, 2005, for the first time you could actually image the coronaries because they developed 64 slice CT scanners. So a regular CT scan you can do on the aorta and the carotid because it's not moving, but with the heart moving, mm -hmm. you have to stop the motion of the heart, and you do that by just uh, uh, taking multi-slice, multi-slice. You can 64 slice scanners. You can see the coronaries very well. Now they have 325 slice uh, scanners with one revolution. You can mm -hmm. see the whole heart. In any case, uh, in 2005, then we actually started for the first time to be able to look at the coronaries, and we started to apply the same hemodynamic analyses to the coronaries. Uh, and in 2009, uh, uh, the FAME studies were published. The fractional flow reserve is measured in the cath lab, mm -hmm. and it gives you the functional significance of coronary disease by computing a measure called fractional flow reserve, which is the pressure gradient across a coronary lesion under conditions of maximum hyperemia, which is induced by adenosine mm -hmm. administered in the cath lab. So the evidence that now the functional analysis in the cath lab of a coronary lesion using fractional flow reserve was actually the best way to treat coronary disease. So there were a number of prospective randomized trials, the FAME studies, uh, which proved that there was better outcome if you used FFR-guided coronary revascularization than visual angiography-guided. So it's better for patients. It also saves money. Uh, so it's a better way to treat patients, but it's an invasive measurement in the cath lab. So we now started to say, well, we could perhaps do this non-invasively by computing the same measure, by computing blood flow, pressure and flow at each multiple points in the coronary tree to create a three-dimensional map of the coronary arteries with computed fractional flow reserve. Now, we don't need to give adenosine when you do the CT scan. Uh, we simulate maximum hyperemia computationally uh, and then we derive a measure called uh, CTFFR, FFRCT, which is a computed uh, estimate, if you will, of the measured FFR. It's not actually measured, it's computed. And so in 2009, we did the very first correlation between measured FFR in the cath lab and computed FFR uh, that we had done now, and it was a blinded thing, and, and mm -hmm. we did this in the cath lab, and both the interventional cardiologist and we ourselves were very amazed that it actually matched. <laughs> because you do things computationally, yeah. it sounds good, but when it actually correlates to real life, Eureka moment. Uh, it, it was amazing. And so then we did a number of trials, and that showed the validity of computed FFR compared to measured FFR. And now it's FDA approved, it's available in the United States, Europe, Japan, uh, and UK. Uh, it's uh, uh, FDA approved, it's uh, reimbursed uh, by Medicare and insurance companies. And it's a better way to evaluate patients with coronary disease to determine what's the best treatment, medical treatment, uh, uh, interventional treatment with uh, a PCI or perhaps a coronary bypass. And so you can actually, in a sense, do a non-invasive coronary angiogram with FFR uh, before you take the patient to the cath lab. Well, we're very proud of the fact that a lowly vascular surgeon, starting in the vascular world, is transforming uh, the evaluation of coronary artery disease. I mean, heart flow has now become a verb, let's do heart flow, a, a noun, it's heart flow. I mean, congratulations, Chris, it's an incredible story. So what do you see happening over the next three, four years? 
Well, what excites me about it, and that the only reason I would I did it, the whole thing to begin with, was because it's good for patients, and and so if it is a better way to manage and care for patients, then it's something of value, and and uh, I believe this really is something of value to patients, uh, including now. It, we as vascular surgeons have been treating patients with cardiovascular disease and as you know atherosclerosis is not limited to one circulatory bed so that if you have a carotid lesion you in all likelihood also have a coronary lesion. If you have a present with gangrene or ulcer in your toe you perhaps prop, most likely do have coronary disease. So evaluating some of these patients who have uh, are symptomatic and who are at risk of coronary disease, and these patients do die of coronary disease, uh, they can now be also evaluated non-invasively. So where do you think it's going to fit into that risk stratification, the logarithm? Is it going to be, if we, we're getting a CAT scan, let's just do get coronary CT and do heart flow at the same time, or are they still going to get stress echoes, stress nuclear, or do you think that's going to become a thing of the past? So, that, so yeah, stress echo and stress nuclear, those... Uh, are basically show you about myocardial perfusion. They don't really tell you much about the coronary arteries themselves. And in fact, uh, they uh, are not very uh, accurate in terms of finding patients with significant disease. The sensitivity is, is quite low. So much so that uh, now with the advances in coronary CT, the UK NICE uh, guidelines now suggest coronary CT as the frontline diagnostic test wow. for coronary disease, not stress tests. The uh, European guidelines for evaluation of patients with coronary disease just, were, just came out at the, at the European Society of Cardiology meeting just a couple of weeks ago in Paris. Those new guidelines also bring uh, coronary CT the front lines for coronary diagnostics. The new U United States guidelines are expected to come out in November of this year. So I think the whole field is moving towards uh, CT as a frontline test for cardiac diagnosis because it in fact finds all of the disease. It may find too much disease in terms of uh, a lot of disease that may not be hemodynamically significant. But the problem with uh, uh, stress tests is that they miss a lot of disease. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then if you find something, then you have to go to further testing. Whereas a uh, CT scan is quite specific. Uh, it alone is not enough, but to select patients for the cath lab or for the further treatment, it's probably a better test. Chris, thank you. Thank you very much for taking time. It's a tremendously invigorating story. Really appreciate it. All you've done and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching.